You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome to A Bible Answer. My name is Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. This program is overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee and faithfully supported by 30 congregations of the Churches of Christ in this region. We're very thankful for them. We encourage you to visit them and worship with them whenever you might have the opportunity. You'll see their names at the end of our program today. A Bible Answer is dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God. If you have a question, please submit it to us at the halfway point of our program. And again, at the end, you'll see our contact information where you may call us, write us, or email us your question. We'll try to answer it on another program of a Bible answer. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Andy Brewer, and I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. My name is Tim Howard. I'm the minister of the Sanford Church of Christ in the Missouri Boot Hill near a town called Steele. Hello, everyone. I'm David Looney, the minister for the Bolivar Church of Christ in Bolivar, Tennessee. Again, we're grateful to these brethren for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. Our first question today goes to Brother David Looney. Brother Looney, what is the abomination of desolation mentioned in Matthew 24, 15? Brother Looney. I'm thankful so much for the question that's been asked. Let's read the passage and get it fresh in our minds. In Matthew 24, verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. There have been many conflicting ideas offered by a plethora of commentators with regard to this matter. But after careful consideration, when you look at the majority, there is one common uh, theme that seems to arise from most. When you compare any Bible subject, it's best to look at all of the verses that deal with the particular subject that you are studying. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place, here it is, the abomination that maketh desolate. In Luke chapter 21, verse 20, And when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, compassed with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. When you look at the commentators, the general idea expressed, the abomination of desolation, has to deal with the Roman armies. I believe it's unquestionably the Roman armies that finally besieged the city of Jerusalem. They are called the abomination of desolation, being heathen armies. They are an abomination to the Jews because they brought desolation on them and upon their homeland. In A.D. 70, the Roman army surrounded and besieged the city of Jerusalem prior to destroying it, the city, and the temple. All of the calamities which had befallen any nation from the beginning of the world were but small in comparison when you think about what they endured and what they went through. You think about it. It was a time of the Jewish Passover. There were three million Jews gathered together on that occasion. Of those numbers, when the armies came and besieged the city and overtook the city, over a million of them were taken. Their life was taken from them. In the surrounding provinces, 250,000 were slain. 97,000 more were taken captive. Some of them were killed by beasts. Some of them were sold into prisons, and they were sent to work. Uh, as slaves. So when you think about this particular question, the abomination that was brought upon the Jews, the city of Jerusalem, was certainly an abomination and it caused them to be in a very desolate situation with regard to the numbers of people killed, the numbers of people sold into slavery, and certainly it was an abomination to them each and every day. It was a reminder of how terrible things truly were for them. 
I hope that this has helped to answer the question for you. Thank you, Brother Looney, for that good answer. Our next question to Brother Andy Brewer. Brother Brewer, how could the patriarchs have lived so long? Brother Brewer. Well, we thank you for that good question, and it's really only natural for us to wonder when we read in the Genesis account of so many men who were living seven, eight hundred, eight hundred, even nine hundred years at a time. <clears throat> it's natural for us to wonder how in the world was that possible? In order to answer this question, I believe it's necessary for us to go back and to see the original circumstances of God's creation. In Genesis 1, verses 6 and 7, we come to the second day of creation. And God took the waters that He had created on the first day and said in verse 6, Let there be a firmament in the midst or the middle of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, how did He do that? Well, verse 7 and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Now in verse 7 you might have noticed that God divided the waters from below from the waters above. Now that's a foreign concept to you and I today because we don't have waters above. We have the waters below. But in verse 7 we find a reference to a firmament of water above the earth. Uh, apparently, as Mr. Henry Morris cited in his book, Scientific Creationism, a vast blanket of invisible water vapor, productive of a marvelous greenhouse effect which maintained mild temperatures from pole to pole was present, thus preventing air mass circulation and the resultant rainfall. And in addition to that, he goes on and mentions how that canopy of water, if you will, would have served as a filter to harmful radiation from space and that that filtering of that harmful radiation would have drastically decreased the rate of aging and therefore death. And uh, then later on in the Genesis account, you remember in Genesis chapter 7, we find further evidence of that water canopy above the firmament, which is the sky. Where in verse 11, when God began the process of flooding the earth, it says that the windows of heaven were opened, and that destroyed the canopy of water and opened, to the, opened the world to the harms of radiation and therefore drastically increased uh, the rate of aging and has decreased the life expectancy to about what we uh, have today, 70 or 80 years. And so you can see a drastic difference in the ages of men from prior to Genesis 7 to after Genesis 7. Uh, and you find after Genesis 7 the ages of men living tapering off over the many years until it was common for men to live only, only 70, 80, perhaps if they're fortunate 90 or even 100 years. Uh, but the reason the patriarchs were able to live so long is because they had that protective canopy above them that allowed uh, them to not be, uh, to not be uh, influenced, their bodies being influenced by the results of the suns and the, the space radiation uh, which harms us today. And so even though there might be other factors included, I believe that that's the prominent reason, the predominant reason, and I hope that that helps in some way. Thank you, Brother Brewer. And now to Brother Howard. Brother Howard, the query says, what is godly sorrow and worldly sorrow? Brother Howard. Well, I think to answer that, uh, we can go through a number of passages. Uh, one in particular is in 2 Corinthians. Uh, the church at Corinth, to whom it was addressed, had been having some problems. And Paul, in his letters to them, was trying to correct and encourage them to do the right thing. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul mentions a previous letter that he had written to them, chastising them for their acceptance of sinful behavior. And in 2 Corinthians 7, beginning of verse 8, it says, Paul writes, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice that not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. 
For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. And those verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And then he says in verse 11, For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. And they list some things which they did. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. And all these things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. There are then, according to the Apostle Paul, many differences between godly and worldly sorrow. First and foremost, as he mentions there, is that uh, godly sorrow leads to repentance. To repent means to turn from our current course, to change direction, to not only accept guilt, but to do something positive about it. Uh, notice in verse 11, again, the positive changes by the Corinthian brethren. He lists a number. What diligence. They were determined to make things right and would not rest until they were right with God. What clearing of yourselves. They wanted to be right more with God than the world. What indignation. Their hearts were pricked and were angry at themselves for allowing this sinful behavior to continue. In the Old Testament, when the prophet Nathan told David that he was guilty of, guilty of adultery and murder, David said, I have sinned against the Lord, 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. You see, David accepted that verdict. As king, he could have said, well, I'm the king, who are you to tell me what's wrong? But he accepted the verdict with godly sorrow and repented of his sins. Fear. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached the first recorded gospel sermon and told the Jews that they were guilty of crucifying, murdering the Son of God. Well, in verse 37 it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized that they were guilty and as such lost. That fear drove them to repent with godly sorrow, with a willingness to do whatever was required to be right with God. Uh, vehement desire. Again, this is wanting to do what God wants more than what we want to do. Uh, a burning desire to be what's right. And then Paul says, you had zeal. We know that Saul had zeal for persecuting the Christians. But when he saw the light, literally and figuratively, he had godly sorrow and repented of his life and changed his ways. And then finally, Paul says, vindication. Divine as to clear of suspicion, to set free. Godly sorrow leads to repentance or a turning back to God. It's being sorry for what it does, uh, being sorry rather for what we did because of what it does to us, others, and most importantly, what it does to God. Uh, we don't want to hurt or to disappoint or, or even as the Bible says, crucify Him. Uh, again, it's, it's not about us, but it's about Him. Worldly sorrow is different. Worldly sorrow leads to death because it does not lead to repentance of a change of actions. Uh, worldly sorrow is, well, we're sad that we got caught. We're sad because things did not work out for us like we had hoped. We're, it, it may be an embarrassment. It may be punishment. But it's not important enough for us to change our minds. I know of people, I'm sure you do too, who've had a lifetime of trouble, uh, even maybe going to jail or to prison for the, the crimes that they commit. And each time they're sorry that they got caught, but not sorry enough to change their lifestyles. And they go right back to whatever it was that they're doing. I think a good parallel between godly and worldly sorrow is found in the lives and reactions of both Peter and Judas. Jesus had told Peter that he would deny Jesus uh, not once, not twice, but three times before the rooster crowed. And, of course, Peter said, No, I, I would die with you, Lord. But yet we see the prophecy coming to pass in Matthew 26, 75. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Then he went out and wept bitterly. Now, Peter was sorry for what he had done to the Lord. But Peter was also willing to suffer persecution, and eventually, we believe, martyrdom for the Lord, as Jesus said in John 21, 18 and 19. Judas, however, is a different story. Jesus had told Judas at the Last Supper, what you do, which betray him, go and do quickly, John 13, 27. 
Judas, we know, led the, the Jews and the Roman soldiers to Jesus in the garden, and they betrayed him with a kiss. But later in Matthew 27, 3 through 5, we read, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is it to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Well, whatever Judas thought was going to happen, and there's been debate about that, to Jesus when he was arrested, we don't really know. But when he realized that it had not turned out like he expected, uh, and that caused him sorrow. But the point is that Judas was sorry for what he had done, but apparently not enough to repent of what he had done. His whole mindset was about him and how it affected him as opposed to the Lord. And so he was not an, sorry enough with godly sorrow to repent and, and to turn his life to Jesus as Peter has, had done. I hope that this helps in answering the question. Thank you, Brother Howard. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. This is a most interesting tract by Brother Perry Cotham, The Godhead 1 or 3. The Godhead 1 or 3. I think this is the first time we've ever offered this tract on a Bible Answer. We're offering it to you today along with our 8 Lesson Bible Correspondence Course if you'd like to have it. But all our materials are free on a Bible Answer. Just let us know if you would like each one of them, or perhaps you have a Bible question you would like to send into a Bible answer. If so, contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at oabs.org, or you may call our toll free number, 1 800 436 0463. That's 1 800 436 0463. We hope to hear from you soon. Back to our questions today. Our next question to Brother David Looney. Brother Looney, is it against Bible principles to vote? Brother Looney. Over the years of my preaching, there have been a number of individuals who have asked a number of questions with regard to the Bible, much like we are dealing with in this very program. And over the years, I've heard people say, Man, David, wouldn't it be good if God just said, Thou shalt not, or Thou shalt, tying in along the line of the Ten Commandments for everything that we do or are not supposed to do? And I said, Well, that would be good, perhaps. I said, But God has given us His completed revelation that tells us how we should be and what we should do. In regard to this question, I think some would say, Thou shalt not vote. Some say, You should vote. I believe it's biblical principle, though. It's not against biblical principle to vote. Here's why. In the scripture, in Romans 13, verse 1, we read, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. In the first seven verses of this chapter, the apostle discusses the subject of the duty that Christians are to have or that they owe to the civil government. This is a discussion that is extremely important and one that is exceedingly difficult. The reason that it is so good uh, is because it specifies how we are to be toward those in civil authority. It can be difficult though when that civil authority or the laws of the land are enacted that will cause us to violate the will of God. Let's make something perfectly clear. If the law of the land tells you to violate the will of God, we need to stand with God. Always stand with God. The majority, it's easy to get caught up in the majority, but stand alone with God. If a person is going to be subject to the higher powers, the government, it stands to reason that I as an individual should use my right and use my privilege to vote for those candidates which most closely align themselves and conform to biblical principles. The ones that we vote for, they make decisions that influence your life and my life and the lives of our children. And so it's extremely important that we know how these people stand and where they stand on the various issues of the day. To refuse to vote is in fact voting. It is voting for the status quo. 
It is voting for the most liberal agenda. It, in fact, is voting for those who support abortion, same-sex marriages, higher taxes, and bigger government. And certainly those things need to be taken very seriously. Voting is a privilege which should not be taken lightly, and it should be done with much prayerful consideration, here again, knowing the candidates, knowing where they stand, and making sure that you use that right and that privilege to vote for the individuals who are most closely aligned with the thus, saith the Lord. I hope and pray that this has answered your question. Thank you, Brother Looney. Our next question to Brother Brewer. Brother Brewer, this person says, my anxiety is affecting my health, family, and work. Where do I turn? Brother Brewer. Well, without being too brief in answering this question, because I, I recognize just how severe this is for many people, I, I would give a brief answer and then I'll expound upon what I mean by this when I say, turn to God. Uh, it's interesting to me that some of the least anxious or stressed people that I know are the ones who are working on their relationship with God the most. In the King James Version of the Bible, you don't find the word anxious or anxiety mentioned. In the American Standard, though, it is, in fact, 18 times. Three times in the Old Testament, 15 times in the New Testament. And uh, Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 33, perhaps, is one of the most prominent passages regarding how we need to be less anxious, less stressed in our lives, and simply learn to trust God. Now those passages are specifically making reference to the fact that we as Christians, if we are truly seeking after the kingdom of God and His righteousness first in our lives, we shouldn't be concerned with those necessities of life. God is going to provide us with them. Now how He provides them is another question for another day. But at the end of the day, the verse says, the passage says, He will provide them. And so in those verses, Jesus is trying to get the point across that we should not be anxious over the haves and the have-nots of life. Uh, we're going to have what we need. Now, we might not always have what we want, but we're always going to have what we need in that specific sense. Uh, however, in Philippians 4, 6, we find a, somewhat of a more general statement by Paul. In the American Standard, it says, "...in nothing be anxious." Now, the King James says, "...in nothing be careful." American Standard, in nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. There's an old adage that says, at times we just have to let go and let God. Now, I'll say that many people may hear that phrase and say, well, that's awful corny, isn't it? Well, at the end of the day, sometimes that's all that we can do, is to just let go of whatever it is that is holding us back, whatever it is that's getting us down, just let it go and, and let God. In other words, turn your affection, turn your trust, place all of your anxiety in the hands of God, and I believe when we do that, we're going to have a much less stressful life. And now, I said a moment ago that some of the people, most of the people in my life that I know who are the least anxious are the ones who are working the hardest on their relationship with God. And so I might give this very brief bit of advice. If you're feeling extremely anxious over something, now the question does not specify what that anxiety is over, but whatever it is, uh, think about some ways that you can strengthen your relationship with God. For instance, pray more. Wasn't that what Paul said in Philippians 4, 6? Be anxious in nothing but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. He closely links the necessity of prayer in our lives to the anxiety that we will otherwise feel. And so I would say from the outset, we need to pray more. In addition to that, worship more. Seek out more opportunities to build that relationship with God through worship. Uh, attend every service of the local congregation. Go to gospel meetings. Go to other occasions where you can sing, where you can study, where you can pray. And, be, and do that with other Christians. It's going to strengthen you. And I know that because it strengthens me. Uh, what about studying more? I know of no guidebook. I know of no self-help manual 
that will do more to help you relieve stress and anxiety in your life than the Bible. Uh, it is the most comforting and hopeful and peaceful book that has ever been written and ever will be written. And so we need to study the Bible more, and it's going to equip us to face that anxiety. And uh, one final thing I might mention is seek more opportunities to share the gospel with people. When we truly get the proper perspective in our lives of what it means to be happy, and what we're truly going to find joy is in is in being a Christian. But when we find the true perspective of what makes us happy in life as Christians, which is going to be praying more, studying more, worshiping more, and being more evangelistic, then we're going to be much less stressful and get much more enjoyment out of our lives now and looking forward to eternity. I hope this helps because there's so many people who are dealing with, with anxiety and I truly think if we were just turned to God and turned to His Word in a much more efficient manner, then that could be something that would be relieved in many places around this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Brewer, and thanks also to Brother Howard and Brother Looney for being with us today, doing such a fine job in answering your questions. We really appreciate it. You know, the Word of God makes it crystal clear that all human beings who have lived, are living, or shall live are in one of two conditions. They are either saved or they are lost. And Paul describes both of these states in these words. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 and verse 23. And therefore, our only hope of escaping this death is to be a Christian. And this is why God was willing to send his son to earth and to give him up in death. He wanted lost humanity to have the opportunity to escape eternal death. And the Son of God was willing, willing to go through a painful death because he loved lost humanity. John wrote in 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The offer from God is the greatest gift, but such will be enjoyed only by those who have an obedient faith. We hope that you will, by faith, obey the gospel today. Thanks for watching, and remember, for your Bible questions, there is always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.